Okay, we'll get this meeting started here. Welcome to the Montclair City Council meeting on this uh, May 16. We'll begin with the invocation, the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll just ask the city clerk uh, to introduce those two individuals. Tonight's invocation will be given by Pastor Joe McTarsney of Calvary Montclair, and the pledge will be led by Mayor Pro Tem Root. Thank you. Can everybody please stand? Good evening. Please join me in prayer. Father, we come before you, and first off, we want to thank you for all the people that make up Montclair. We ask you that you provide mercy to them and keep them safe tonight. We do thank you for the members of our city council and our leadership that serve our community. Please keep them healthy and strong, and may they never grow weary while they're doing good for others. We also do pray for the main decisions that they will be making that will affect other people's lives. Grant them your wisdom, Father. And I thank you that you are faithful to hear and receive our prayers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please join me as we salute the flag of our country and all that it stands for. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And obviously, we'll remember those in uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, and, and of course, the city of New York, a uh, city of Buffalo. So now we'll take the roll call. Councilmember Lopez here. Councilmember Martinez here. Councilmember Johnson I'm here. Mayor Pro Tem Rue present. Mayor Dutre uh, present. Thank you. So this evening we have a uh, presentation by Monta Vista Water District to update us on the emergency conserver conservation regulations. And uh, general, man uh, the general, man general manager, Justin Cole, has come to the, uh, to the podium and I asked him to speak to us tonight. So uh, to discuss the, the Metropolitan Water District uh, emergency meeting they had last month. Um, and they, this whole thing about June 1st and watering your lawn one day a week. But he's going to, Justin's going to explain that a little better. But obviously I want to recognize your bosses, uh, your president, Santa Rose, and and, of course, a, a director, Tony Lopez, in the audience. And I think perhaps Director Manny Martinez may be on the, f on the phone. So, Justin, it's all yours. Thank you so much, honorable member, members of the city council, uh, city staff. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here to speak about this very serious situation, a uh, uh, severe water supply shortage. Uh, that the state, and in particular our area of the state, is currently experiencing. I'm going to move uh, as quickly as possible through my slides, but would be happy to pause or address any questions at any time and go to give any further information that's desired. Uh, as I think we're all aware, the, uh, California is in a state of emergency uh, that has been declared for all 58 counties uh, for a, a statewide drought. Uh, it is due to a significant shortage of uh, w precipitation that you can see here represented in the most recent uh, uh, depiction of California in terms of drought by the U.S. Drought Monitor. As you can see, the entire state is in a drought condition, and a significant portion of it is in extreme drought condition. Uh, inclusive of the area that we uh, receive our imported water supply from, which is basically that northeast uh, corner of the state uh, where we rely on precipitation that comes uh, and gets captured through the state water project uh, uh, and then is transferred down uh, through the delta into the California aqueduct, about 660 miles all the way down uh, to Southern California to supplement our uh, local water supplies. This water supply shortage is a shortage on imported water, and I wanted to make sure to emphasize that. We do have, uh, fortunately, uh, local water supplies, particularly our groundwater supplies, and those are tremendously beneficial to us in being able to face uh, uh, such a shortage. And so it's good to have a robust and diversified uh, portfolio of water supplies, and uh, particularly in situations that we are facing right now. How do we get here? Just a few slides from Metropolitan Water District's presentations. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side a representation of the uh, deficit in precipitation over the last three water years, the, 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 the current water year that we're currently in the midst of. And you could see we uh, uh, just uh, started a decline that became precipitous uh, in uh, water year 2021. We had a little bit of a, a, a benefit in uh, the rainfall that we all uh, received in December. So you can see that uptick. Uh, but then since then, it has been a very precipitous decline 
in, 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 or increase in our deficit uh, from where we should be. And unfortunately, this is showing itself to be worse than even our pro best projections statewide. The Department of Water Resources' lowest forecast for state water project uh, availability uh, was one million acre feet. Uh, today, we're looking at nearly half that. Uh, so this is why we're in such an emergency situation, because it's worse than actual uh, our, our long-term projections had showing. And so we're all redoing all of our projections due to this situation. And so what does that mean for us? Unfortunately, we are in a portion of the Metropolitan Water District service area, and they are the imported water provider for most of Southern California. In fact, they provide water to one out of 20 people in the entire country. They're a, a huge water supplier, very important uh, for, for Southern California and us as, in particular. We are in what's called a state water project dependent area. And what that means is that even though Colorado River water even flows right through our district service area, because of water quality issues, we can only use state water project water in our service area. We're not allowed to use Colorado River water because it has higher salt content, and if we use it, it would further degrade the water quality in our groundwater basin and have uh, significant impacts. And so we are uh, dependent on state water project. Also, other areas of, of, uh, of uh, Southern California, including portions of Los Angeles, uh, as well as areas in Ventura County, Las Virginis area, are also very dependent. And they uh, actually lack some of the local supplies that we have. Uh, and so they're in very serious conditions. And so as you can see graphically depicted here, while the Colorado aqueduct is the, pri is the primary source of imported water, we have very little state water project on top of that. And so the uh, orange and red shows our deficit. The Metropolitan Water District is trying to make up for that deficit through uh, their uh, planning efforts for their water surplus and, and, uh, and, and demand uh, management plan. But as you see with the red, they are still in a shortage and so they cannot meet normal demands in our state water project dependent area, hence our emergency conditions. And so they have developed and have passed, a, as the mayor mentioned, a framework for emergency water conservation program. Initially, that was only going to be one path for compliance, and that would be the one day per week that everyone's been hearing about that could become no days per week uh, irrigation uh, if, uh, if conditions continue to worsen. We advocated very uh, 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 strongly through Inland Empire Utilities Agency, and I should give them very great credit for hearing our, retail, uh, our concerns as retail agencies with other water water supplies and we and and through their advocacy there was a second path that was developed for compliance and that is basically instead of prescribing for us how many days per week we would have to enforce within our service area that they would just provide us with an allocation of imported water that is equitable across the state water project dependent areas. How much can you give us? And then we determine that allocation. And for us, we believe that we can meet uh, 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 dem uh, uh, demands with, with some uh, demand reduction, but meet our, our demands uh, with those uh, uh, volumetric limits. So we are following the path to where they provide us with an allocation of imported water. And that added to our local supplies uh, provides us with uh, uh, a, 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 a solid uh, uh, way to move forward. Uh, and that really is because, and it's very serious, uh, conservation has become a way of life for Monta Vista Water District customers, for the city of Montclair's residents. Uh, the residents here, the businesses here, have done a tremendous uh, work in reducing water usage over the last two decades. Uh, they are down now on a per capita basis 40 percent from where the uh, from where we used to be in the late 90s and early 2000s. And you can see that in this graphic that was reported in our 2020 urban water management plan. Um, they uh, we were required to reduce by 20 percent uh, from a baseline by 2020. It was the 20 percent by 2020 or 20 by 2020 uh, 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 framework. Uh, our baseline was calculated on an 10 year average from the late 90s to the early 2000s, and that came out to 205 gallons per person or per capita per day, GPCD, gallons per capita or per person per day. So our target, a 20% reduction, was going to be 167 gallons per person per day. But our customers, your constituents, uh, doubled that and actually reduced their usage by 40% on a per person basis. And uh, we were able to report very proudly 124 gallons per person per day. And as you can see, we are the most 
most efficient water users in the region uh, and uh, are helping the region keep our gallons per capita usage down. And that means that we don't have to take as severe measures as you're hearing about with other agencies. And so what are we doing? What are we requiring our customers to do? Well, many things that we've been requiring since uh, we adopted an ordinance uh, 33 in 2010, uh, we're requiring that irrigation be efficient, uh, that watering should not occur after rain for a period of time, uh, that a leak should be fixed. But we have added to that in December and, and declared a significant water supply shortage and, uh, and asked our customers, requires our customers, to reduce irrigation to only three days per week. And those specific days are Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And so our customers are required to only irrigate on those days and only in the evening hours between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. And the reason for that is that is when the winds are most calm and that is when the sun is not up and creating evaporation, that is the most efficient time for irrigation. And, uh, and so uh, that additional requirement has been in place since mid-December. We're also requiring not hosing down pavements or buildings. Uh, we ask people to reintroduce themselves to the broom and get some exercise, or if you have children, you have them exercise and, uh, and clean things the old-fashioned way. Uh, to always have a shut-off nozzle with, uh, when washing any vehicles. Uh, we are restricting fire hydrant use to firefighting only, except with a water management plan for construction use. Uh, restaurants are required, and they have been since 2010, to only only serve water upon request, hotels to only uh, to provide the option to launder linen daily. And then our wholesale customers, City of Chino Hills, is also required to reduce by the same amount that we're asking our customers to reduce. In fact, they've, they've exceeded that goal, and they are being very good, strong partners in make, making sure that they meet the reduction requirements we're asking uh, of our retail customers. And so we have enhanced conservation programs in our communications. Uh, uh, we are uh, enhancing our water efficiency programs. Uh, we are implementing new programs focused on helping those who have leaks to fix those leaks and trying to incentivize and provide programs and expert assistance for doing so because that's just wastage that is not necessary and, uh, we, and, and can be solved with the right expertise and, and, and resource. Um, and our big message, and I believe each of you has our bill insert that is going through our, in our bills right now, which is asking our customers, telling them, we really need people to cut your water use now. And it is very serious because, as you can see, uh, it's feast or famine in California in terms of water. Uh, in 2019, we had a full or Lake Orville. Uh, right now, it's very close to empty, not looking good at all. And so we need our customers to reduce their water use as much as possible. If possible, we ask them to reduce it beyond three days a week, down to two days a week, or even to one day a week, if they can do it. Brown lawns will be something that we will be facing uh, this summer throughout uh, Southern California. Um, uh, and uh, it, you could even call it in a drought time a, a kind of a mark of pride, so to speak. Um, uh, but if there can be a minimum level of irrigation, um, uh, as an absolute minimum, that's great. But we are also emphasizing the importance of maintaining the tree canopy and maintaining the health of trees. And if needed to hand water those trees to keep them alive and healthy because they're so hard uh, to replace uh, and, and really uh, our trees are very important so we are also emphasizing that point and then if anyone sees water that is flagrantly being wasted let us know we'll reach out we're, we're not the cops you know we, we don't we don't have the huge enforcement mechanism what we do is we communicate we over communicate we constantly communicate and so uh, anytime anyone sees water being wasted you have a phone number there in 267-2130 there is a website that is an easy reporting mechanism. You don't get in trouble, they don't get in trouble, but we just provide the information that customers need so they understand the requirements and how they can quite easily meet them through common sense. We're spreading the word uh, through various and multiple communications. You're going to see, you're going to get quite sick of hearing about the drought quite soon. You're going to see a lot of communications from local agencies, regional agencies, from Metropolitan Water District. Uh, it's really going to start flooding the airways, so to speak. And that is my very quick uh, review of our severe shortage uh, uh, conditions. Uh, we are asking our customers to extend, to uh, really stretch themselves as much as they can. And let me just say our customers, in my experience, 15 years working for Monta Vista Water District, our customers have always responded. Your constituents have always responded to these requests. And I, this is, I think, the third or fourth drought that I've experienced. I can sort of almost feel like I, I, I've uh, implicated in this. Uh, uh, starting work in 2007, and that's what the, the, a drought was just starting then. And we've, uh, we've gone through this multiple times to the point where I think we're seeing this as a constant condition. And so we're going to have to try to find a way to maintain 
efficient usage. And I would say our customers are at the head of the pack in terms of meeting that goal of efficient year-round using water as efficiently as possible. And that's why we're able to not have to go to the one day a week at this point. I can't make any promises. If the water conditions get worsened, we might have to go to higher levels of shortage declaration, or at least to recommend to the board to consider that. But at this point, we believe if our customers continue to do their part, we can meet this challenge throughout this year and also into next year. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or uh, uh, well, better, you, better uh, explain. Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank Just you. a real fast couple of uh, questions. Uh, so the baseline is 205 from, uh, from Monta Vista Water District, and we're currently at the actual 124, which is a 40% reduction. And um, so 40% reduction. So we're asking our customers to, to do more to get, go below the 124? We are. Voluntarily? Uh, I assume it's voluntarily. Am I correct? It is, yes. Uh, it, 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 well, w the, the requirements are mandatory for three days a week irrigation. All of these requirements are yeah, mandatory. Three days, that's new. Those are the new requirements. Yes, the three days okay. a week is specifically the right. new. The other requirements have been in place on a mandatory year-round basis, but the three days a week is new. And we will continue to look at the circumstances, and if we need to go to higher levels and go to two days a week or even one day a week, we may have to do that. But at this point, we at believe this point, we can get through. point, we're at three days a week. We're not yes, one sir. day a week, but if... A, if the resident wants to go to one day a week, they can do We should do so, but right now we're staying three days a week uh, between 8, 8, 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, so we get 30% of our water from from the state system, and 70% comes from the, J, to the Chino base. Am I correct? For, uh, for our agency, it's closer to half and half at half this time. Half from Although Vista? We, yes. If, in most recent history, it's been about half and oh, half. Oh, 50 50. What about IUA? Uh, well, IUA, it's about 30% in total. Okay. All right, 30% total, but Monta Vista gets 50% then. Yes. Now, we are having some treatment plants coming online that will give us greater access to groundwater. So I would say once those treatment plants come online and they're moving forward in an emergency basis, we will have additional capacity, and we're going to really try to shrink that imported water demand to the minimum level. So it probably will get closer to 30, if not lower, in the interim, in, in this short time frame for the critical for these situation. treatment plants. Now, I know IUA is working on treatment plants as well to dump more of the wastewater into the basin. And I also believe there's a plan to try to get more runoff water into the Chino Basin. There are. There are ongoing plans Multiple for doing years, that. But that's time. a few years in the future. But those two things alone will help to I increase the capacity of the water in the Chino Basin. We do that. And, and, and reduces the dependence on the state water system. Yes. That is the goal of both of, of yep. all these programs. Yes, sir. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Rue. Yes. In looking at this one, what you said about brown lawns will become the norm. I know I had a conversation from the uh, state board with Laurel Firestone, and she said something very similar. Um, I know at in my other life, my other, why is this flashing at me? In my other world, on the state regional water quality, regional water quality control board, we've been taking this very seriously and looking at. This, there is a statistic that from the last drought, it seems that the lower income census tracts did a better job at conserving water than the high end census tracts. And we have to make this felt all over. It can no longer be a thing, and Metropolitan needs to understand this just because you can afford it, you can have it. You know, we all saw the story about Santa Barbara, and the people said, we'll pay whatever it is. We saw the coastal Orange County situation, we'll pay whatever it is. Um, and that needs to end. We also know that our current landscape palette that's used not just here in Montclair, throughout most of Southern California, is one of mowed green turf. And that's going to have to go. I, I, I plan to have a, a conversation as a private citizen with you know, builders and developers because that palette needs to be ended. It's not healthy. It's not good. People tell you, oh, they fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. 30 years later, we're cleaning it up in the water system. So fertilizer is not the answer. It, the answer is change the outdoor landscape palette completely, and I hope we can do that. Um, the question I have is what if the targets are not met? 
So our, what we're currently experiencing, and, and these targets, by the way, we, we already have met. So right. we met the 2020 target. It was just to illustrate right. how efficient uh, your, your, uh, your constituents are. Now, where we stand in the second path is that we are already going to meet our target because they're simply just going to allocate the amount of water that we are allowed. And if we use collectively, if the entire IUA service area uh, collectively uses more than that on a monthly basis, and they're measuring this on a monthly basis, then we will be assessed penalties of $2,000 per acre foot on top of the about $1,000 per acre foot we, we already pay for it. So a very severe penalty to quote unquote incentivize us to not go above our target. So the volumetric limits and the allocation that they provided to us through path two, we have that has that will be reallocated by IUA's board on Wednesday when they okay. take their own action, we believe is sufficient for us to meet the minimum level of demands, inclusive of the 15% reduction goal that we're asking all our customers and the additional reduction we're asking our customers to do even more because we're it, it's too close to the line for me as a manager. I want even more. So I, as much as we can reduce as possible, we believe that we will be able to meet all demands uh, 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 with this allocation and our local supply. Because I, I'm not as worried about outdoor. I'm worried about outdoor in the sense that I think people will, they're not going to take the cutback seriously. And I want to see that we have water for our hospitals, for our schools, our emergency providers, certainly our fire department when they need it. And indoor use, people are going to need it for things. I, I have my own way I deal with it inside. But um, I hope people start to take this seriously. And then at, you mentioned about the trees and the tree canopy. One of the things that people can do, and I don't know if it's been any of your literature or not, they're large tree irrigators. They're large green bags. Well, the ones I have are green. I'm sure they're different colors. And they're heavy. You buy them at Home Depot, at Lowe's, at Ace, online, in a, any number of places. And you fill the bag up. And over a three, four day period, it slowly drip irrigates the tree and at least allows the bark to uh, the, the outer part of the tree to absorb some of the water. It's not a perfect solution, but it will help keep the tree canopy alive. Not perfect, but. It's an excellent uh, uh, suggestion, and, 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 we, and we are uh, uh, advocating, w when we're asking, advocating right. for uh, reduce as much as possible, maybe let your grass go uh, brown, but s please save those trees well, in what, when, at whatever way is, is most convenient for the customer. Right. And even with, with uh, washing your dishes, of course, I'm single, that's maybe a little bit different. Um, I haven't used the dishwasher in a long time, but I have one plastic bottle, squ spray bottle, with the soap in it, the other with clean water to just rinse it. So I put the soap, clean it, then rinse it, wipe it down, and it's good to go. It saves a lot more water that way. We're going to have to be more creative. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilman Lopez. Uh, Justin, uh, my colleague, Mayor Pro Tim Rue, kind of touched on what I was going to ask, and that is I, I, too, don't see residents taking the cuts as seriously, and they're going to be passive about it, until there is some degree of penalty for their inadequate use. So until there is some teeth applied to the cuts or the, the restrictions, I think that they will have this mentality that doesn't apply to me, it applies to my neighbor, but I'm going to continue doing this. And that could very well be the case, and I think the only mechanism by which they'll change that mentality is if they start seeing either fines or whatnot assessed on their bill or red tag this or that or even threats of cutting off water service. I don't want it to get there. Um, what I understand you were explaining that collectively with the allotment that we're going to be getting through IEUA, should we fall below that threshold and we're assessed fines of $2,000 per acre foot? That obviously has to be passed on somewhere. That cannot just be absorbed through your budget. You have to make up for it, and of course, it is dependent upon the ratepayers. What, what do you intend to do, or the board do, in the in the event that we get to that point, or do we or we prevent it from getting to that point so residents can actually take this seriously? Because I do know. Let me go to the page. I do know that many residents currently 
As I've been aware that these restrictions have been in place for a while, the voluntary, uh, voluntary, um, voluntary uh, restrictions, the certain allotted number of days that you're supposed to water during the certain seasons, the recommended days for fall, winter, and spring. You guys sent that out through the mail. You guys have them out as magnets to, for people to put on their screens. I'm looking for the uh, page. There you go. It's actually on, on the screen. I do know folks that do not use a hose, and they do still hose down their driveways and or while they're washing their car. Um, I wish they would park it on the grass temporarily and wash it so that way the water just drips on the grass. Uh, but I do know of some that do not water on just Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. They, have, they water every other day, and then they think it's hot. I need to water an extra day to compensate for the heat. So here we are, and um, I know some businesses, unfortunately, their runoff is bad because the sprinklers, I understand, kids or whoever walk by damage their, their uh, pods on their uh, sprinkler system. Um, what are we going to do to get, try to avoid those scenarios? First off, we have enforcement me mechanisms already in place. So anytime anybody sees water being wasted or you just think it's being wasted or just being badly used, please report it to the water district through the um, report waste link or just by calling the 267-2130. Uh, it's very simple, very easy. You don't have to leave your name. What that triggers is our response. And our response initially is to communicate with the customer and make sure they're aware that they're wasting water, that that is against our ordinance, and that we will enforce that. If notification does not provide the response that we need, and then we follow up and we you know, drive by, we check things out, then we have fines. And we have a fine structure in place for the significant water supply shortage declaration of, I believe, $100 to $300 fines, depending on, on the incidents. So we do have fines in place. If the fines don't work, if, some, if a customer is just openly and flagrantly wasting water, then we are authorized to install flow restriction devices. And those flow restriction devices are what we install on the meter, which is part of the water district infrastructure and that we control, that limits the water flow to that property to what only is needed for health and safety. It's not enjoyable, it's not of a high pressure, but it does provide sufficient water for health and safety, which we're obligated to provide, but it does limit the amount of water being provided to that customer. So we have never had to do that as of yet in any of the droughts that we've had in the past. We may need to do it in this circumstance. We also have additional shortage declaration stages that are available to us with higher levels of restriction. Uh, we can go to two days a week and even to one day or even no day a week irrigation. Uh, we can limit uh, uh, or even outlaw any uh, 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 washing of vehicles, except in commercial vehicle washes, which do recycling of that water. And so we tell our customers, you can't wash your own car at this time, but you can take it to a commercial car wash. We can uh, uh, limit or say to our customers, you cannot refill your pools, uh, because that is just, just not the highest and best use of water at this time, because we have to reserve water for the critical needs, such as hospitals and so on, and for the human health and safety needs indoors. We have all those tools available to us. We, at this time, believe if we can maintain the savings and enhance the savings as we are going to be working with our customers to achieve that we can meet our delivery obligations without those, without those higher levels of enforcement. But we have those always in our pocket, available to implement at immediately uh, once we present the findings to our board that we need these additional enhanced enforcement mechanisms and the board authorizes it, and then we immediately enforce and communicate that to our customers. Well, you brought the issue about pools, and that's going to prompt another question, but mm -hmm. a follow-up to that is your rate structure. Um, do you not allot a certain number of gallons per household? Because let's, let's face it, household sizes are increasing with the advent of those renting rooms, with ADUs being constructed on properties. You have more bodies using water on a particular parcel piece of property. So do you not allow for an increase... Uh, number of gallons of water per day per week, whatever you decide, is that still not the case that is also part of the rate structure package? I'm so glad you raised that. Uh, we have what's called a budget-based tiered rate structure that we implemented back in 2009, and it does allocate sufficient water under the lower tiered prices for indoor needs, tier one, 
outdoor needs, tier two, and then inefficient uses, tier three, and then wasteful water uses, tier four. And that price goes up quite significantly. And so that has a price signal built into it to keep our customers, to help our customers understand how, what is efficient water usage and to try to stay within that. It can be adjusted through a variance process for the number of people per household. And if our customers apply and provide sufficient uh, 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 information that we can increase the tier one allocation for higher than the four people per person per household, which is the average for our service area. And so if they apply for that variance, they can apply for it on an annual basis. They have to reapply every year to ensure that that is still an accurate uh, allocation of water. And then real quickly about pools. Obviously, you don't want them to refill their pools uh, as perhaps as often as they did. But are you working with the West Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District to make sure that you don't have stagnant water that is not treated? Because then we're going to have a very serious mosquito problem. Well, the, the, the stagnant water that's untreated is the property owner's uh, responsibility. They are responsible for ensuring that the water in their pools is maintained at a certain chlorination level to avoid the, the, the stagnant level that can create vector issues. Uh, we are, are very in close contact with the Vector Control District. Uh, however, I have not yet heard that uh, restrictions on pool refilling, which we have not yet put in place, but we have that available to us, uh, would directly lead to green pools. But that's an excellent suggestion to make sure we at least inform them of that requirement if that is put in place so that they're aware of it. Thank you for that. Thank you, Justin. Absolutely. Uh, Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hello, Justin. How are you? Hello. Great. Great to see you. I, I think you answered my question, but I want to make sure that I understand it. There are some of us who have significantly uh, reduced our water usage, but based on this guidelines, not enough. So there's more to be done. But here was my question. If um, our independently wealthy millionaire who lives in town says, I don't care how much the water costs, I'm just going to keep doing it. So what does this volumetric limits mean? You can just turn off the water. I think I heard you say that you can put something on the meter. It, can it, you it, just... If this, if this uh, uh, millionaire who doesn't care about the amount of water usage is openly and fl flagrantly violating our water use requirements and has been repeatedly notified and fined for that, we, in the end, are authorized to put a flow restrictor on their meter. And so typically a meter is usually like three inch or one inch uh, diameter to provide sufficient flow for a typical household needs as well as fire protection. Once we put a flow restrictor, that is for the absolute minimum health and safety and fire needs for that property. And what that does is greatly restricts the amount of water and the pressure of the water coming into that home uh, because of the restriction of flow. It is not how we like to provide service. Uh, it doesn't uh, give you a good, nice uh, uh, pressure in your shower, for instance, or in your sink, but it provides sufficient water for, uh, for, for human needs. And will the water ever go off, I think was my question. If they've, they've used their whole volume and there's a trickle in the shower and they've just done everything and there's nothing left. Well, at that point, and we've never gotten to that point, uh, uh, so I, I, I have to speculate. Um, we, you know, the, the, we, we, we can get to the point where they're just constantly fining and flow restricting. I think that's the, the extent of what we're authorized currently for doing. We do shut off service for non-payment, uh, but that typically is at a very short time frame uh, and, and, and doesn't have, have the, the impact that, that what we're discussing would have. Okay. And I, and I think that the message would finally get across. People, don't, people like to live with, with water. It, it tends to be a, 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 a bedrock uh, need uh, for, for, for normal lifestyle. So we hope that that would be sufficient. Well, when the shower starts to trickle, that would get my, that would get my attention. Thank you, Mr. Coe. We appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, I know we're trying to get to get this wrapped up. Mayor Pertin, do we have anything else to say real short? Just one last uh, item. You mentioned uh, swimming pools and... I think, I don't know if it's state law or not, but I believe you have to have your swimming pools covered when they're not in use. I would encourage people to really cover that swimming pool when they're not using it. It's you know common sense to me, but then at least whatever uh, may evaporate, you can keep some of that back in the pool because the way the pool covers are. So I would truly encourage people to use pool covers. Thank you for that encouragement. And recycling fountains where the water is. Your, I know some people in town have koi ponds, things like that. Use, re, use the same water that will recycle itself. 
Absolutely. Well, great, and I and I and, you know I think it's nice to know that uh, here in Montclair uh, there's been a 40 percent reduction from your for, for your 2020 tar target, and that uh, not just Montclair, the whole region has done a good job in reducing the amount of water, and so this emergency that M MWD is doing is we don't have to do the one day because of the sacrifices we've already done, and I really think it's all about education, doing an education campaign. I really do believe that much of the public is already aware of this one day thing or the emergency. It's pretty obvious, you know, we know it's, it's not raining as much, so there, we know there's an emergency out there. So I appreciate you coming down here today, Justin, Thank along you. with uh, President uh, Rose and uh, Director Lopez. And uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move on to public comments next. And this is an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any item, on, I would speak on something that's not on the agenda. Uh, obviously, we can't discuss it among the city council. And if you wish to discuss an item on the consent calendar, there's also the opportunity to bring that up. You have five minutes. If you're on an electronic device, such as an iPhone, you'll hit the, uh, the raise hand feature just uh, to request to speak. And if you're on a phone, you'll hit star nine to request to speak. And if you're in the audience, obviously, you'll submit a speaking card. So I'm going to ask the city clerk if she has any public speakers today. I have no um, cards from the audience. I did receive a written comment via email, and also uh, Mr. Bruce Culp is raising his hand. Okay, then we'll start with uh, Mr. Culp first, and then we'll go with the written, the written comment. Hello, Bruce. Hey. Can you hear us? Hi, how are you? Yes, can you hear me? It's all yours. Go all ahead. right. Um, <clears throat> that was a great uh, presentation on our water saving uh, policies, and I hope everybody uh, continues to save water. Um, it sounds like the residents of Montclair are doing their part and working hard to save water. Uh, as a resident, I turn that back to the city council, uh, as I mentioned before. You guys also have a role in this. Um, and the mega drought that's coming, you know, these droughts are bigger and more uh, severe, and that's a result of global warming and global climate change. And those are based on not necessarily, you know, not just uh, national policies, not just state policies, but every local uh, government and local uh, elected officials has a responsibility to do uh, to minimize uh, their their local city's um, impact on the environment. When we do that all collectively together, uh, we reduce our effect on global climate. These uh, droughts become less severe, and then we uh, replenish our water supplies again. And we get out of these droughts, not all the time, but they're not as severe and they're not as bad. So I'm asking you as a city council to do your part, like we residents did, and uh, vote out uh, and op oppose development in our city that um, creates undue um, environmental uh, harm. And then as, as we do it and other cities do it, uh, we will collectively um, increase uh, the water supply once again, um, long term. You know, you got to have some of these short term uh, policies that we're doing right now. But the long term is is we've got to change our ways um, and um, eliminate these uh, mega warehouse projects and oppose them at every uh, point we can, so that we, uh, you as city officials, do your part as well as us residents. So I'd like to say that. Uh, in regards to um, Ben Lopez's uh, statement regarding penalizing people for bad behavior, I'm glad you support that because, um, you know, your bad behavior uh, is costing me money. Uh, it looks like, oh, and I want to speak on item 10A, by the way, today as well. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, your poor behavior is now causing us an extra $5,000. Won't go to Safe Roots to School. Won't go to any other uh, thing. We're going to take that out of the general fund because of your bad behavior. So I'm glad you want to be, you know, you support penalizing people, entities for their bad behavior because um, so far the city council has really not uh, penalized you whatsoever. I mean, I'm gonna have to pay for your sexual harassment prevention training. Uh, and so are other residents. And I would like, um, the, I would like the council to require that um, the city, his city council pay be um, forfeited and put into the general fund until that sexual harassment training is, is paid off. 
Additionally, I think he needs to report back after his training uh, at the next city council meeting and tell us what he's learned about it, how what behaviors he performed and how they were wrong so that yeah, we know Bruce. that he was passed along. Yeah, Bruce, so, I think this is item TNA you're talking about right now. So um, you still have another minute 35 to go. I'm going to continue talking about that. Um, so, you know, uh, Ben, you need to resign. You're costing the city tons of money already. You, you're continuing to uh, cause, um, you know, this is like a bad dream that keeps going over and over. So please um, resign immediately. Um, I don't know why you're allowed to sit on the council up there, uh, you know, while the employees have to stay at home that were uh, victimized by you. Uh, your pictures up there that they have to look at all the time, it should be a wanted poster. Um, and so um, I really ask that the city council take more severe actions uh, and just not reward him like this where I have to pay for his sexual harassment training. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we have one more speaker on the, as far as the written comment received. I have the written comment, yes. Go ahead. I'll go ahead and read that. Um, this was from Ms. Becky Esqueda. Mr. Mayor and city council members, this is concerning cars going straight through the stop signs on Vernon and Orchard. On January 31, my daughter Antoinette and husband Robert were involved in an accident which totaled her new car, where the driver of the speeding car went right through the stop sign and also damaged the Edison utility pole. The police were called to the scene and filed a report. Since that time, there have been numerous cars driving right through. People are too busy on the phone and always in a hurry, not paying attention. The concern is also for the safety of the children walking from Vernon Junior High, south on Vernon and crossing over Orchard, and the children from Our Lady of Lords School. When will there be solar stop signs installed on Orchard and Vernon? Since the solar signs have been installed on Benito and Vernon, still there have been drive-throughs. All it takes is a split second for someone to get hit and run over and you suffer great consequences. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and if staff can get back to her, I appreciate it on her question. So we're now done with public comments. Now we go down to public hearing. We have one item to consider ordinance number 22-1001. This is regarding um, the uh, mandatory organic waste disposal. So we have staff presentation, please. And I'll step out for a second. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, I understand that we're now transitioning from water to organic waste, and I think Justin wanted to actually come up to the podium and talk about how he can squeeze organic waste to get water out of it to help uh, replenish the aquifer, but looks like he's ready to leave. So I'll, I will take over and, and do the presentation for him. So as you know, SB 1383, which is the short-lived climate pollutant reduction law, was adopted back in September of 2016. It establishes statewide targets to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases such as methane and other byproducts of organic waste to combat climate change. Organic waste is defined as food, landscape and pruning trimmings, lumber, wood, manure, cardboard, paper products, printing and writing paper, and other plant and animal-based products. SB 1383 establishes the following goals. It reduces organic waste disposal in landfills by 50% by 2020 and 75% by 2025 and will recover at least 20% of edible food that is thrown away by 2025 through donations to people in need. Top anthropogenic producers of methane, as indicated in the following chart, are agriculture, energy, and waste production. So you can see that the largest producer of methane, of course, is wetlands. That's a natural source. Uh, wetlands, of course, are, is a natural environment, been around since uh, uh, the beginning of time. And that is not considered the type of methane that is being targeted by SB 1383. It is agriculture, it is energy, it is waste, and it is these other uh, issues that are addressed in this particular chart. Methane escaping into the atmosphere is a climate pollutant that is up to 80 times more potent than carbon monoxide in warming the planet over a 20-year period. Decomposition of organic waste in landfills produces an estimated 21% of the anthropogenic methane. According to the International Energy Agency, the current concentration of methane in the Earth's atmosphere is 2.5 times greater than pre-industrial levels 
and that level is steadily increasing. Natural sources, the wetlands that I discussed earlier, uh, of methane emissions represent 40% of total emissions of methane, and anthropogenic sources uh, represent the remaining 60%, of which an estimated 35% comes from agriculture, 25% from energy production, and 21% from landfills, with the balance uh, from the other sources that were indicated in that chart. California Department of Resources and Recycling and Recovery, or CalRecycle, which we all know it by, has been working on regulations since uh, 2016, uh, and those regulations are designed to achieve the goals of SB 1383. CalRecycle regulations took effect in January 2022. However, CalRecycle did anticipate that agencies throughout, city, uh, throughout California would have developed their local ordinances to implement the provisions under SB 1383 as well as the Cal Recycle regulations. That did not occur. Very few cities actually adopted and developed the ordinances by January 2022. So Cal Recycle is now working with cities uh, to make certain that they get their ordinances in place and implement the provisions of SB 1383, uh, including the development and adoption of their regulatory ordinance. And they will not focus on enforcement actions against municipalities that have not implemented those ordinances for now, as long as they have a plan that is designed to implement uh, the provisions of SB 1383 and Cal uh, Recycle regulations. And of course, uh, uh, Montclair is considering the adoption of the ordinance this evening, so we obviously did not meet the January 1, 2022 uh, deadline, as did not most cities in the state of California but we have been working with CalRecycle and explaining to them what our plan was and that we would be working with Burtec, the city's waste hauler provider, uh, as well as working on development of the ordinance that has been presented to you this evening for your consideration. All local jurisdictions are required to adopt an organic waste disposal reduction ordinance that enforces the purpose and intent of SB 1383 and CalRecycle regulations. <coughs> Local enforcement of SB 1383 and Cal Recycle regulations is mandated to begin no later than January 1, 2024. Cal Recycle will impose penalties on any jurisdiction that fails to have an organic ordinance, uh, waste disposal reduction plan, and an edible food recovery plan as follows. Major violations will be $7,500 to $10,000 per violation per day not to cumulatively exceed $10,000 per day, including the following violations. Failure to have a provision in a contract franchise agreement that requires a waste hauler to comply with Cal, Cal Recycle regulations. Failure to have an edible food recovery program. Failure to have a record of implementation of SB 1383 and Cal Recycle regulations. Failure to properly enforce a local ordinance. Allow violations prohibited under Cal Recycle regulations, failure to properly submit reports required under Cal Recycle regulations, and willful misconduct. Under the ordinance, uh, City of Montclair's uh, compliance responsibilities include provide organic waste collection services to residents and commercial multifamily housing generators. Multifamily housing are five or more units. Establish an edible food recovery program conduct annual education outreach to all generators of organic waste, procure certain levels of recovered organic waste products such as compost, mulch, and renewable natural gas, maintain records for SB 1383 annual reporting requirements, establish an inspection, investigation, and enforcement program, comply with Cal Green Building Standard Code and model water efficient landscaping ordinance requirements, and establish a waiver program for de minimis and physical uh, space limitations. Burtec's responsibilities under ordinance number 22-1001, and Burtec again being the city's uh, solid waste hauler, um, they're required to introduce uh, requirements related to single family, commercial multifamily housing generators of organic waste, including providing written notice that organic waste recycle programs start July 1, 2022, obtain city approval to haul organic waste, transport source separated organic waste, Comply, <coughs> comply with education, equipment, signage, container labeling, container color, contamination monitoring, and reporting requirements. 
coordinate with facility organic waste recovery treatment operators and community composting operations, participate with city, the city in allowing for a self-hauler program for source separation of all organic waste generated on site and haul to designated facilities provided self-haulers maintain appropriate records of the amount <coughs> of organic waste delivered, <laughs> delivered to facilities. Recovery requirements related, <coughs> related to commercial edible food generators and food recovery organizations. Those are the tier one and tier two providers. Uh, commercial customers to be informed of their ability to donate edible foods. The tier one compliance date is July 1, 2022. And tier one includes wholesale food vendors, uh, food distributors, grocery stores, and food service providers. Tier one compliance date is January 1, 2024. And that category includes restaurants, hotels, health facilities, large event venues and state education agencies with uh, food services. Commer commercial generators shall contract with food recovery organizations or food recovery services to recover the maximum amount of edible food. And again, that target is 20% and maintain records, including providing an annual recovery report to the city. Vertex responsibilities also include assisting Montclair with achievement of procurement targets for city departments, service providers, and vendors. For example, based on the city's current population, uh, compost annually would be 1,837 tons, mulch 3,168 tons, renewable natural gas uh, for heating 69,992 therms, and for vehicle fuel 6,625 diesel gallon equivalent um, uh, energy components. And electricity generated from biomass conversion of locally derived organic waste would be 766,627 kilowatt hours. Uh, Bertex will also assist the city with inspections, investigations, and enforcing requirements, assist Montclair's enforcement efforts beginning January 1, 2024, uh, provide contamination prevention observations. So, for example, uh, they will regularly check to make certain that residents and commercial uh, operators are complying and not contaminating uh, other uh, disposal uh, bins with uh, food waste or other organic waste. Assist Montclair with inspections and investigations. Uh, that will be normally operational through the city's court enforcement program, but Burtec will be a large part of that enforcement effort. SB 1383 mandates the local agencies adopt companion ordinances for compliance uh, with Cal Green building standards. Uh, essentially for design standards consistent with the city's organic waste recycling program and the model water efficient landscaping ordinance for incorporation of recycled organic mulch and compost, compost into their landscape designs. The city does comply uh, with those requirements already because the city council has adopted uh, both Cal Green building standards as well as a moder model water efficient landscaping ordinance. In addition, uh, relative components of each of those ordinances have been adopted, uh, have been drafted into uh, ordinance number 221001 so that there is easy source of reference within that document. Other SB 1383 uh, mandates include annual education and outreach to all generators for organic waste uh, achieved through regular, and this is achieved through regular inserts placed in sewer and trash buildings. Burtec involvement in and distribution of materials. So for example, Burtec will participate in the city's uh, country fair jamboree and the national night out and will provide information at that time uh, to residents coming to those types of events. The city's internet homepage will certainly have links to Cal Recycles homepage as well as discuss the requirements of uh, SB 1383. Newsletters, automated calls, school presentations and other social media outlets will be another source of dissemination of information related to uh, implementation of SB 1383 and feedback from waste hauler routes. So in other words, when the uh, BIRTEC employees are on their routes, they will make observation regarding compliance with the requirements of SB 1383. Uh, procurement of targeted amounts of waste products is also an area in which BIRTEC and the city will work jointly together in relation to compost, most renewable natural gas and electricity generated. And I discussed the targets uh, related to each of those items previously. And Burtec will assist the city in reaching those procurement targets. SB 1383 also mandates the local agencies are required to comply with uh, procurement targets. Uh, again, I've discussed what those procurement targets are, but also in relation to paper products that contain at least 30% of post-consumer recyclable content. 
record keeping and, rep and reports provided to Cal Recycle in all aspects of SB 1383 mandated and pro uh, programs. And these reporting requirements include organic waste collection services, waste hauler programs, contamination minimization, program waivers, education and outreach, edible food recovery programs, recycled organic waste procurement, recycled paper procurement, uh, commercial edible food generators, and jurisdiction inspection enforcement. Bird Tech and City staff will use database software designed to allow uh, easy tracking of all the requirements under SB 1383. Uh, BIRTEC will also have responsibility to ensure that commercial, multifamily, and single-family residential organic collection programs are properly uh, and effectively integrated, in, integrated into the community. In relation to residential, uh, all, residential uh, re all residents in the city of Montclair, or, or all residential households rather, will be required to subscribe to the city's at least three container collection system. Those containers are the current ones that you have in your homes now. Uh, the green container, which is used for source-separated organic waste, including food. That will be the new introduction. Uh, the blue uh, container, source-separated recyclable materials, and the black container, which is the household non-organic solid waste. When it comes to organic food waste, residents are expected to source-separate the organic food waste store and store it in plastic bags or another container that is tied or secured to prevent leakage and spillage and then place that bag into the green container. Residents are required to subscribe to the city's organic waste collection services for all organic waste. There is no self hauler component for residential uh, service. At its option, if the city determines that there is a significant production of organic food waste, then we may be required to implement uh, a four container collection system, which would be using a brown container for food waste. In relation to commercial and multifamily housing generators, uh, they also are required to subscribe to the city's at least three container collection system. That would be the green container for organic waste and the food waste, the blue container for recyclable materials, and the black container for non-organic solid waste. However, the city will observe how the process is moving along with commercial and multifamily. And if required, we will transition this program to a um, four container program in which brown containers will be required as part of uh, the service that is provided to commercial and multifamily. And they will use the brown container for source separated food waste. Organic food waste shall be source separated, stored again in plastic bags or other containers, and then deposited in the green waste containers under the three container program. Alternatively, organic food waste would be deposited again in the brown container if the city finds it necessary to transition to the brown container. Commercial multifamily generators are required to subscribe to the city's organic waste collection services for all organic waste. Um, and again, as indicated, if necessary, we'll migrate to the uh, fourth container. Uh, Burtek will also work with the city in relation to uh, providing waivers for commercial and multifamily units, uh, uh, generators of organic waste. If a uh, commercial provider uh, generates less than 20 gallons for businesses that produce two cubic yards or more of total solid waste per week, or less than 10 gallons for businesses that produce less than two cubic yards of total solid waste per week, then there is the opportunity for a de minimis waiver that will not require that that will then uh, excuse them from participation in the organic waste collection program. Uh, Burtek will also work with the city in relation to physical space waivers. Uh, so as new development comes into the city, the city will evaluate each project to make certain that there is sufficient space within their uh, refuse uh, response program to provide for the three and ultimately the four containers. Um, if, existing or if existing commercial and multifamily projects, including uh, future projects, don't have the space available availability for the fourth container, then we will work with them to make certain that they still have an effective program or otherwise give them a physical space waiver. Adoption of ordinance number 22-1001 would have no readily identifiable impact on the city's general fund 
SB 1383 language amendments will be required for the existing franchise agreement between the city and Burtek, and we will be bringing those amendments back to the city council at a future date. Uh, we will also be required to make adjustments to the fee resolution to accommodate the changes and transitions to organic waste uh, uh, disposal. And the uh, city, again, is working with Burtek in relation to developing that necessary fee structure. It is staff's recommendation that the uh, council introduce and conduct first reading of ordinance number 22-1001 and set a public hearing for Monday, June 6, at 7 p.m. in the council chambers to consider second reading and adoption of ordinance number 22-1001. That concludes my presentation. I do want to make note that Mike Aragon, the king of Burtek, is in the audience this evening and he's available to respond to any questions that you may have, along with myself and our finance director, Jenna Colbeck. Thank you. Let's uh, open this up to a public hearing, and uh, again, members of the public which is speak. You can submit a, sp you can sp submit a speaker card in the audience. You hit your, uh, uh, your hand raise if you're on an electronic device, or hit star nine if you're on a phone. So, Andrew, do you have any members of the public that, that wishes to speak? Um, no one in the audience here, but Bruce Culp is raising his hand. Okay. So Bruce is the only person so far? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll take Bruce Culp. Bruce, you have five minutes. You there, Bruce? Okay. I, yeah, uh, I'll make a uh, statement, then I probably have a question for Burtek at the end here. Um, you know, I remember last time that this was discussed at a city council meeting before it went to a public hearing today. Um, it, you know, a lot of the city council members sounded, made it sound like this was, you know, really hard to do or, you know, you had to have a... a a degree from Harvard to try to figure out how to remove your scraps off your plate to get it into a, a plastic container to to do this. Um, I can assure you that I've been doing this uh, since I was a little child. We had a compost. Uh, my dad grew up on a farm and he showed us how to compost and save your table scraps and put them out there. This is not rocket science, people. We can do this. Uh, we separate things out every single day, all the time. It's a very simple process. Um, I know hundreds of probably residents already do composting within the city. So um, don't worry, residents will be able to handle this, no problem, um, if you have any questions or concerns about that. Um, for uh, residents of, uh, of uh, large complexes, like I live in here at Pasteos, uh, the bins we have here are uh, green and white. I've never seen white. I guess that's supposed to be the recycle bin. Um, and the space that they're contained in is, is can only hold that size of uh, only those two containers. So I'm guessing uh, what is going to be the, I, I may have missed this uh, during the presentation. I'm sorry, Mr. Starr, but um, what's going to be the uh, course of action for uh, uh, these uh, commercial buildings, uh, uh, multifamily housing, where we only have uh, a green and a white container, and we need to put our scrap for the remaining residents here that have to do that. Well, the city, the city and Burtek would be working with uh, each of the property owners or the managers for uh, multifamily housing units and will, uh, if it's possible, to bring in an additional uh, container for the uh, organic recyclables, then that is the objective. Uh, it is understandable that a lot of the multifamily housing units do not have a current green waste container because uh, the landscape services that are typically provided. Uh, the workers that they employ typically take the organic materials away from the site and deposit it at some other uh, facility, typically a, a place that will handle organic waste, or they combine it with uh, other properties that they also provide landscaping services and then ultimately deliver it to the end destination. Uh, in the case of the color of the bin, I, I understand you have a white bin, but uh, there will be labels that will be placed on the bins to identify what you're supposed to be putting in that particular container. Uh, but again, when it comes to the organic waste, there will have to be a requirement uh, to work with the property owners or managers to get in that third bin for the organic waste. If not, uh, if they require a waiver or if there is a lack of space requirement, then the city and Burtek will work with uh, each of those property owners or again managers to provide the necessary waivers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and no other, I'll close the public hearing then. I'll bring the matter back right, to- We do have one more raised hand. <laughs> Go ahead. That's Carolyn, Carolyn Raft. Hello, Carolyn. Go ahead, Carolyn. You there? Hello? 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, good evening, um, Mayor and City Council and audience. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm assuming that Bertech and the city will send out notices to all the residents exactly how to uh, distribute their food as to what goes into what container. And once this is passed, which is going to apparently be on the next uh, public uh, uh, hearing, uh, how soon will all of this go into effect again? Yes, Bertech as well as the city will be providing lots of educational material over the course of the next couple of months and consistently thereafter. Uh, the implementation is July 1, 2022. Our enforcement doesn't begin until January 1, 2024. So in the interim, it's educational. It's getting residents as well as the commercial operators to participate in the program, get everything set up uh, uh, from July 1, 22 on, and then... And then that was not me growling. And then on uh, January 1, 2024, uh, enforcement will begin and those who have not complied at that time will be facing violation considerations or uh, certainly notices telling them that they are in violation, giving them an opportunity to correct the violations. If not, then uh, the city would be issuing citations. Okay, I, I appreciate that. and. Uh... I would like to say to Bruce, I appreciate your comments that you gave uh, tonight. So thank you very much. And I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. I will now close the public hearing and I'll bring the matter back to council. So Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, a question and a comment. So on in the, at one part of the presentation, Mr. Starr, the page that talks about um, recovery requirements and commercial com customers to be informed of their ability to donate edible food. So I, I know that in some organization when there's an event and there's lots of food and there, there's always been a cry, well, let's give this food to the homeless people, but you can't do that because in case they get sick, then you're going to, they're going to sue you. So does this change that? There's the Good Samaritan law that comes into play in here and the ordinance does specifically address the Good Samaritan law and under uh, that provision, you are excused from that sort of liability typically. That's good to know. And then the comment that I have, um, when we first heard about this, I, I thought it was nuts because I had no intention of leaving trash on my counter when I have a perfectly good garbage disposal. But um, the more I thought about it, the more I understand that this is really not about, this is more about composting. And so, but I didn't want to do it. But I discovered, I thought about it, and I realized that all of us probably, at the end of our dinner meal or whatever our large meal is, that we put stuff in little plastic containers and put it in the refrigerator and pretend like we're going to eat the leftovers later, which we never do. And then, you know, the day before trash day, you dump it all away. Well, instead of on the day before trash day, instead of putting it down the garbage disposal, I can put it in a bag and put it in the green waste. So that eliminates me having to have a bag of trash on my counter because I'm not doing that. Um, but at least I can comply with the regulations. And I think we all can apply or find some kind of way to make it work for us. That's all I have. Thank you. Mayor Pertenru. Yes. Um, to begin with, I'm a bit confused on this, and maybe it can be clarified. According to this, organic waste is defined as food. Okay, I get that. Landscape and pruning trimmings. Well, I thought those were supposed to go into the green waste, not with food. Lumber, wood, that would go again into the green waste. Uh, but this is the one that creates the confusion. Cardboard, paper products, printing, and writing paper. How, are, how is that organic based? This paper, I put it in the recycling bin. I don't put it in a food bin. This isn't food. I can't eat paper. So how do we deal with that one? Uh, and that is a transition in the program. So you're right. Typically right now, you put that in the recycle bin. Uh, but it is considered organic because it is made of a, uh, a it's derived essentially from trees. And so it is an organic material and it can be turned into compost as well as mulch. So the intent and desire is that that become part of the organic waste stream as opposed to the recycled stream now. So our newspapers and all of our paper will now go into the green waste uh, as my understanding is that I, I think that Mike Aragon wants to get up and address. Mike. 
Because that's, that's asking people to change everything they're doing. I don't understand how this paper or cardboard box is food waste. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Starr, and, and again, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, Mike Aragon, Vice President with Burtek Waste Industries. <clears throat> uh, Councilman Rui, it's an excellent point that you bring up. And uh, while um, uh, Mr. Starr is absolutely correct that paper is an organic-based material, um, it, it will not, the program will not deter you from putting it into your blue container. Okay. okay. So still go ahead and you can put your paper in there. Uh, a lot of this was food soiled paper and in your recycling barrel, as you know, in the past, we have asked that don't put in food soiled paper in your blue barrel, pizza boxes that still have cheese on them or grease or things of along that, along those lines. And we've asked you to just throw that away. Now, if you have food soiled paper, it can go into your green waste container. Okay. Um, but if you just have writing paper um, and a cardboard, continue to recycle as you have been recycling, even though it's literally accepted in both containers. Uh, that should be explained to, re to residents because I think if I'm confused, they're going to be confused as well. Absolutely. And, and there is, as Mr. Starr mentioned, uh, going to be a very extensive public outreach and education program. Um, we didn't want to put the cart before the horse, so to speak. Um, there are several steps. This one tonight being the first in accepting and uh, uh, putting into effect an ordinance. Once the ordinance is uh, 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 approved and qualified, then we will have those features reflected in our agreement with the, with the city so that it mandates us to perform the myriad of, of, uh, of uh, job duties that Mr. Starr um, explained in his presentation. And may I say, it was an excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to take you on the road, Ed, and uh, you and I will, will uh, uh, make sure it happens at all cities because that was extremely thorough and to the point. Um, and uh, there is a lot to this uh, particular um, uh, Senate bill, and um, it is um, a struggle for a number of communities, but we have a very uh, comprehensive plan that we've submitted to the city. Um, we just need to go through the other processes. We are working, uh, again, hand in glove with Cal Recycle, um, so we're, we're on target. The, another question I have is, it's in regard to a fine. If people don't meet a certain level, well, what about people such as myself who do not throw away food. I actually, if there's something left over, I will take it to work the next day or eat it the next mm -hmm. day. I do that. I grew up very poor. We never wasted food, period. Um, at times I will, if there's something left over, maybe I will chop it up and give it to my dogs. Bread, rarely does it go to waste, but the few times it does, I then break it up, put it in a bag, and I'll take it to a park and feed birds with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't throw away food. So what, where does that leave me? Because somebody's going to say, you are not complying, so you're going to be fine. So, I mean, I even take food when maybe I make too much of something and I'm not going to eat it all. I put it in containers and I do find homeless people to give it to. Uh, where does that leave me? Actually, all of those things you mentioned are perfectly fine. Um, many people, as there was a caller on earlier, that, that backyard compost, and so probably 100% of any food waste would go to his compost pile, and he wouldn't have any food to put into the program. That's not where the penalty would be assessed. Okay. The penalty would be assessed if we literally have to inspect the trash containers, and you cannot have organic material in your trash container. You cannot have organic material in your uh, recycling container, organic being food waste or green waste. Um, and then we ask that you package your green waste, so your, your food waste, so it doesn't contaminate the, the green waste. Um, there are some programs that say just throw your food waste in with the green. We get, once, once food waste is mixed with green without it being separated in a plastic bag, uh, the only thing you can do with that green waste is to compost it. And our green waste, we get so much of it in, there's only so much compost that we can 
produced, and the balance goes into um, uh, mulch and um, um, uh, wood, uh, wood chipping and, and things of that nature so that it does not have a food contaminant, and it can be processed much quicker than a long composting process. But all of those things that you mentioned, uh, Councilman, are, are perfectly fine. Um, we just don't want to, or at least Cal Recycle just doesn't want to see you putting organics in the, um, in the trash because the, the premise of this whole law is to keep organics out of the landfill. And then how, um, if somebody does have food waste, what type of a bag do they put it in? Is it something they buy at the grocery store? Is it something they buy at the hardware store? Is there a specific type? There's different thicknesses. How do they know? And, uh, and it this, adds cost to them. This, uh, again, you have great questions, Bill. Um, this will all come out in our education plan, so it'll teach. And, and I believe um, um, Carolyn called in and says, well, I, I need to know how this works. It, it'll all come out to, to um, uh, explain how to participate in the program. Um, but the plastic bags that we required, it does not have to be um, because there are um, uh, decompostable plastic bags. Well, we're not, we're not composting the plastic bags. We are literally collecting it with your green waste. It's going to our facility. Those plastic bags have to be manually extracted from the green waste load, ripped open, and the food waste processed. So you can use um, any type of plastic bag. Um, if you uh, use uh, produce bags, for example, I'd probably use a couple of them because they're very light mill. Um, kitchen garbage bags, used, fre uh, Fred, used bread bags, uh, used uh, Ziploc bags, anything that you have that can be secured in some fashion and you can put in um, your food waste. There's, there's no real regulation to it. I would try to use, um, I, I probably wouldn't go through the expense of, of going and buying bags, but if, if you don't have any of the other bags, uh, uh, a simple um, uh, kitchen bag or, or something smaller, if you can get it, um, would, would suffice. And then you know, the, the reason I ask this is it's not as easy as everybody may think it is. People will have these questions. I can picture mm -hmm. an average Absolutely. homeowner who may be in their condo, their home, where apartment, mobile home, wherever it is, wondering, well, what do I do with the cardboard? Well, we have to figure that out because yes. it goes, does it go in the blue one? Does it go in the green one? They may not know what to do, as you said, with the, the uh, box where there may be cheese or something left in it. So, I mean, that's one of the things that makes it a bit confusing. Residents have to figure this out. And then just a, a comment on recycling in general. <clears throat> when we have containers that may have the, plastic, the, the little plastic milk bottles and things like that. I'm told we have to rinse those out because that residue isn't good, yet we're in the middle of a drought where we're supposed to be saving water. Yeah, in the very early stages of recycling, um, they asked you to rinse things out and whatnot. The technology behind the, the plastics recycling and container recycling is such that we do ask you, don't throw a half a quart of milk oh, no. um, or a half a jar of mayonnaise or peanut butter. Scrape it out, but it doesn't have to be rinsed out and it doesn't have to be completely devoid of all the material that has adhered to the side of the container. Um, no rinsing. You don't need to do anything along those lines. Um, your, your, um, and, and we do reinforce that in our newsletters and whatnot that go out. Um, our information online, uh, please, uh, residents can, can look that up and, and get uh, uh, numerous recycling tips on, on how to participate. Uh, but believe me, our plan, uh, subject to city approval, will be a very extensive uh, public education program as well as a community meeting so that folks can have these same questions and um, and get those answered. And as Mr. Starr mentioned, it, it's just not a flash in the pan in the beginning of this program. It'll be ongoing education throughout the program. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Councilman Lopez. Hi, Mike. Thank you for being here. Um, my sentiments haven't changed since January 18th <coughs> when you presented this to us via Zoom. 
um, not fond of the mandate from the state on all localities, not just ours. In the analysis in which they, the legislature produced, they admitted, and I'm quoting, that it would be potentially in the tens of millions of dollars or more to local governments. So they're not even going to reimburse us for any of the of the steps we're taking now to implement the program. Now, I, and I've said then, and I'll repeat it now, this is not the fault of you or any other trash hauler in the industry. Right. This is a mandate that the state is putting on you guys. And I will say that you guys have done an effective job at, to the best of your ability to implement all the provisions of the new uh, law. It's no longer a bill, it is a law. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm opposed to it. Um, it's almost offensively absurd to have residents put their food scraps in a white plastic kitchen bag, throw it in with their green waste, where the green waste potentially contains twigs, cut rose bushes with thorns, branches, you name it. And in the process of collection that your trucks engage in, where the arm picks up the container, dumps it in, those bags are not going to be intact. They're going to be ripped to shreds right. with food contaminating every single green waste along with grass, you name it. So it's absurd. It's going to be an extra burden on you to sort. You're not going to have too many bags to pull out with food. I guarantee you're not. Um, and I would like a tour after this is all implemented sure. because I want to see it actually happen. And I will be willing to give you 100 bucks <laughs> if indeed that there's a bag that is in, intact with food because I doubt it's going to happen. Um, so it's just unrealistic to ask for that. And then therein is the joke about this bill. Um, but let me ask you this as well. Obviously, there is going to be an added cost to implement these provisions because mm -hmm. we contract with you as our trash hauler since we do not have the in-house means to collect and get rid of waste. Have you calculated those costs yet to us as uh, your client? Uh, we have. We'll be presenting those costs to staff shortly. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, there was a comment asked about at our presentation on January 18th regarding the use of garbage disposals. Mm -hmm. And I have here an email a response to that question from the city manager dated mm -hmm. January 20th, uh, where he quotes Mr. Benjamin Johnson from Cal EPA, and I'm quoting, has effectively responded that use of garbage disposal, while not prohibited as a home convenience, is not a suitable or recognizable organic recovery slash collection service as mandated by SB 1383. Therefore, its use as an alternative collection service does not comply with the regulations developed pursuant to SB 1383. Is there going to be some, some sort of monitoring of food waste dumped into sewers as a result of garbage disposal use? That um, is, is something beyond what we're um, uh, able to monitor. All we can monitor is what's in your trash and what's in your barrels that are set out at the curbside. I think ultimately um, uh, IEUA may have something with regard to your solids and, and whatnot that are going down if everybody did that. But uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the objective is to keep your material, organic material, out of the waste stream. Um, some people throw it down the garbage disposal. Some people will put it in their composting bin. But if you have that material, you have that food waste, and you're not getting rid of it in another fashion, you cannot put it in your trash, then you would need to bag it and put it into the um, uh, green waste container. Now, in reference to your, your comments with regard to the green waste bags and whatnot, um, there is going to be breakage. We, we, there's a, about a 10% um, allowance, actually, that is built in that still keeps us safe with our green waste. We've had probably about 4,500 or close to 5,000 homes that have been on pilot programs for about 18 months. And so we've been doing the collection and monitoring that. Um, it is not a perfect program, but your alternative to that would be, as Mr. Starr indicated, a fourth barrel. Now, the difference between putting plastic bags in your green waste barrel and a brown barrel, which would be a fourth barrel, is that your green waste barrel, putting the food waste in your green waste barrel, you have zero additional collection cost. If we have to put out a fourth barrel, you not only have to pay for that fourth barrel, 
but you have to pay for an entire route, truck, yeah. truck manpower, yeah. or multiple trucks yeah. to pick up the food waste. So our objective was to keep and regulate these costs uh, and keep these costs down. And we uh, devised this program. We um, uh, ran it up the flagpole, so to speak, with Cal Recycle. They were um, in agreement. We perform pilot programs so that we could justify that it is a viable program and works. And now that has been um, the uh, direction that we are going with all of our, uh, at least our valley cities that we collect um, with, uh, that have green waste barrels right now. I will say that we have cities in the high desert where there's not a lot of green waste and they only have a two barrel system. And now they are having to go to a three barrel system and um, um, experiencing the cost of the, that additional route. So um, um, I think we should, should be pretty happy that we already have a program that we can just capitalize on without any additional cost. They'll all, they'll all have additional processing material costs, and that is where we have to physically pull the bags, open them up, and process the food waste. Um. Well, my contribution to this whole effort has been losing 100 pounds and not eating as much these days. So um, my food carbon footprint has decreased significantly. Um, let me ask this. Perhaps our city manager can ask this, and I don't know if it relates or dovetails into what services we contract with Vertec. <clears throat> On page 26 of, the, of our agenda, it's page 19 of the ordinance, uh, enforcement pursuant to this chapter may be undertaken by the city enforcement official or his or her designee. One, who is going to be that city enforcement inf official? Are we hiring an additional staff person to address this? If so, or if not, who is going to be the designee? Is the designee going to be represented from Vertec? Or what is the structure going to be with respect to this official? And then with that in official, the all-encompassing power of investigation, uh, inspections, and the whole penalty process. The bulk of it will fall under code enforcement. Uh, that is a area of uh, inspection re compliance requirement that would be part of what code enforcement would do anyway. But with the assistance of BERTEC, because of BERTEC's uh, uh, duties in relation to uh, being responsive to each of the routes that they handle, uh, the observation of the drivers as to what is being deposited into their trucks as they lift the bins and dump them out, uh, it will be a joint effort. So we're not going to have a separate designated force, if you will, does, uh, set aside just to go about town inspecting trash cans? No, that is correct. We will not. We're, we're um, if I could... Sure, um, please. mentioned councilman um, part of our duties as again as mr. Starr indicated in his presentation is that there are um, mandated audits that we have to perform residential and commercial um, and it can either be at curbside or we can collect and bring it back to our MRF open it up and literally go through the trash uh, to identify where um, uh, if that particular group of homes that we're picking up has contaminants. And if so, then we narrow down. Would pick up the whole trash can and not, not empty it, just take it with you to your facility? Is that what you're no, saying? No, we would, we, would, we would have a selected, um, selected homes, random. They would go into a load. They'd dump it on their trash day. Okay. We would dump it. We'd go back, analyze the load, and say if we had 100 homes and we found... Um, the contamination level that was beyond what was acceptable, then we know, okay, that came from one of these hundred homes or multiple of these homes that are audited, and then we narrow down our focus. We'll be reporting that to the city, identifying to what we think we can look at uh, from an address standpoint, and then turning that report over to the city. At that point in time, I think Mr. Starr indicated that it may become a code enforcement issue, and they would knock on that door and say, okay, we need to uh, well, get better at where, that, where we're that operating. That kind of plays into my uneasiness and my concern because we have a horrible job of educating our public as it is just with the blue cans right now. 
we have folks dumping drywall in blue cans, garden hoses in blue cans, cactus in green cans, which they're not supposed to because it's a succulent, toys in blue cans. We have a resident down the street from me who constantly dumps their uh, unused toys in the blue can, or they leave them out in the, in the alley for free pickup. Um, it's, it, there's a level of education that needs to be done to solve the problem with the blue cans right now. How in the world are we going to master education with food? I have no problem if, if it was, to me, this isn't as a burning issue as perhaps it is for others. Food will eventually go away and biodegrade and go return to the earth from which it came, so to speak. Plastics, rubber, those things that are human-made, they're not. So therefore, I can see the urgency in addressing that plan, and I'm all in favor of doing that and even uh, citing residents that abuse that uh, uh, system. But we're talking food here. I mean, the dead carcass of an animal is going to go away over time. I mean, it has been since the beginning of time. Um, but I, I don't want there to be a, a scenario where we start, for all intents and purposes, having a reporting system of residents snitching on residents because they're not they're improperly dumping food. Should they go and inspect cans? I just don't want our residents to be made criminals, if you will, for not dumping their food in the right container. I just, I just see the absurdity in that. And I know it's not you. I know this is the state. And if my, our, our representatives right now are listening, Senator Leva, Assemblyman Rodriguez, they voted for this bill on October 31st of 2016. I wish they wouldn't have, because they're not thinking this through. It's gonna cost us thousands, perhaps a million dollars over time just addressing this. I, it, it's absurd. What you should do, sir, and the owners of your company, is send them a bill for all the added uh, extra money you're having to expend to, a, to a, a co comply with the, these provisions. Join with your fellow haulers in the industry. Let's do it. I mean, because it's absurd. This needs to stop. I, in theory, I understand the concept. I, I, can, I can go along with it. I was going to be in favor of a fourth can. I even brought that up at the meeting on January 18th. Why can't we just go to a fourth can? But I know it's costly, as is everything. But doing this program is just going to be just as costly. So uh, therein is my frustration. Uh, and, and totally understood. I, I know just, uh, and, and I know I'm, I'm probably taking up too much time here, but just to, um, to let you know that we have, as an industry, um, uh, had our uh, differences with this legislation and have lobbied against it. Um, or for a different approach since 2016. Unfortunately, well, um, uh, the law as it is passed is what it is. Um, and all we are doing and all the city is doing, the state has created a law. The city is now held liable for that law, and we are the bridge between those two uh, elements. Um, so the audits, the uh, inspections, all of that, we're not doing one thing more than is than what is called out in the regulations. Uh, but we are checking every box from a regulatory standpoint so that the city of Montclair is in total compliance. Yeah, Mike, uh, I think... Uh, ben, Mike, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for opposing the bill like you said you did. Yeah, I, absolutely. I appreciate at least knowing that. Thank you, absolutely. Mike. Absolutely. Yeah, so going back, I, I believe there... Isn't there some bills currently in Sacramento? Uh, there are... Um, I think it, 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 it just has to deal with more timeliness of the implementation of the program and, and um, uh, when enforcement takes place, but not to the level of uh, changing the requirements of the bill, okay. at, at least to my knowledge. And so far, as far as your other client cities, the Inland Empire, uh, have already adopted this similar ordinance. This is, this is basically an ordinance that came from Cal Recycle. This is a boilerplate ordinance for the most part, but do I understand it? Yes. And uh, so I understand uh, Ranch Camunga, Montana, San Bernardino, Upland have adopted this ordinance. These are large cities. I believe the city of Ontario is not a client of yours, but they also have adopted this ordinance as well. Right. And uh, I know some of your Riverside County cities and high desert cities have adopted this ordinance. So uh, we're not the only ones doing this. We're probably a little behind the ball now because they have already adopted it and we're still working on this. So, you know, uh, you know, we, uh, unfortunately we're creatures of the state, the cities are, and I guess, I guess a good example when I say that is redevelopment because uh, I thought redevelopment was protected and then 
court's rule basically the state of California is, is the creature and, and we work for the state of California for the most part. And so uh, they were able to get rid of redevelopment. And so there's many laws that are, are fortunately adopted out of Sacramento and they come to this level or the level that I serve on at Omnitrans or SBCTA or Metrolink and you're not excited about it, but your hands are tied. And if you just decide not to execute it, then you're going to be in trouble. In this case, uh, I think in this case, it's $10,000 a day fines. That's about, what, uh, $3.6 million a year. And, of course, on top of that, they'll still sue you in court, and you're going to pay for all those, all those fees and charges. And uh, so that's the unfortunate part is, is that we, we're, we're placed between a rock and a hole. We're the ones that need to go out and tell the residents directly, not our local legislators who voted for this, but it's us. And so, uh, you know, politically, it'll be nice to just vote no uh, on this. I don't like it. I'm not going to vote no, but I realize politically that's not the right action we're supposed to be taking place. Is this is a public policy decision, and uh, and uh, so we're pretty much forced to do this. And I know that uh, you spent the last four years, Burtek and others, trying to scratch your heads after the adoption of the law. Mm -hmm. I do believe that a very strong education campaign is needed. And it's the same thing we did, uh, was it 30 years ago, with recycling. I'm right. pretty sure there was a lot of controversy behind that. And it's worked out, it's worked out well after 30 years, but, uh, um, you know, it's education. If the person is putting, you know, putting uh, food in the wrong container and you guys pick it up, well, I think the first thing that needs to take place is that uh, there's, a, there's a knock on the door or a letter sent to that resident. It's an education component. It's not Absolutely. code enforcement. And I'm here to give you a fine of $100, right. and uh, uh, we're going to beat you up. It's going to be all education. Um, and I think most residents, when they understand it and want to do it, uh, uh, will for the most part comply. But it's going to be some time to get there. And, uh, you know, as I stated, uh, if the public embraces this, which it may happen, then, uh, then the program will, pro will work well, not just to Montclair and other cities, but if the public does not embrace it, and, and it's not going to be just to Montclair, it will just be uh, you know, throughout California, then I think our friends in Sacramento are going to have a problem to figure out, you know, this is their idea, and the public doesn't want it, either you're going to have to find, amend the law that's, that the public will accept or get rid of it. So I, I believe tonight we should go ahead and move forward with this, with this uh uh, with this uh, ordinance, and so I'll move for approval. If I can find my, where is it here? Follow-up question, if I might, Mr. Mayor. So I'm going I'm to go ahead and move to adopt the extent, oops, this extension, uh, let me see, am I green? oops, I'm looking at the wrong one, excuse me. Page seven, I'll move to adopt, uh, uh, move for adoption of uh, ordinance number 22-1001 in the following staff report and, and declares as a first reading and further reading be waived, be read and waived. There's a second with the motion? Second. Second by uh, Councilman Johnson. Councilman Lopez, you have a comment? Uh, either to Mr. Starr or to Mr. Aragon, real quickly, re regarding the education aspect, the education campaign, as you know, our town is 60 some plus percent Latin in origin and a very high Spanish speaking community. I, I'm assuming the materials will be printed in Spanish and if there is going to be door to door education that there will be at least some Spanish-speaking people to accommodate the, our Spanish-speaking residents? Well, all printed material will certainly be in English and Spanish. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, let's have electronic vote. And again, this is the first reading. Okay, uh, the motion is adopted four to one, and uh, we'll go down to consent calendars. And anybody on my left? Mayor, I know, would uh, you Diane, like me to you want to read sorry? the ordinance? <laughs> I'll read the ordinance. Go ahead. Okay, ordinance number 22 1001, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Montclair amending sections within Chapter 6.02 definitions, repealing section 6.16.025, commercial recycling and organic waste recycling slash diversion and 6.16.030, garbage to be wrapped, of the Montclair Municipal Code, and adding Chapter 6.17, establishing a mandatory organic waste disposal, disposal reduction program. Thank you. Okay, consent calendars. So the first item we have in the consent calendar that I was asked to remove is C1. Am I correct, Diane? Diane? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else on my left want to pull a consent calendar item? 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to please pull C like Charles, 6, 7, and 11. Six, seven, eleven. Okay. How about my right? My uh, my items are overlapped with uh, Councilmember Johnson. Okay. And then Mayor Pro Tem Rue, you have anybody? No, okay. 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 Items C one, C six, C seven, and C eleven have been pulled. I believe item C one, uh, Diane, is just some language change. Yes, I just want uh, to add to the recommendation that we are authorizing the city manager to sign the agreement. That's it. Otherwise, it's good to go. Okay. All right, next one is items. If I may, by the way, I, I did need to go back to uh, ordinance number 22-1001. Um, I did put some minor changes in front of you. They're very minor, just uh, changing... Uh, or adding a, a couple of words in relation to the city and Burtek being our designee in a couple of areas and then dropping the D on franchise to just read franchise. So other than that, nothing significant. Okay. I don't believe no objections to the language that's in this ordinance and it will not. Okay. Item C6. Uh, uh, really? Let's have, go first. Go ahead, Denise. I have, just have a quick uh, comment. Um, I, I just want, I don't have a question, I have a comment. I just want to say that I think this is a fabulous idea because when we are having trouble obtaining staff, what a better way to have the firefighters working with them to help bring them on board. That's all I wanted to say on okay. C6. Thank you. Anybody else on C6? Nobody else? C7? Um, I have a question, I believe, for Chief Avels. I just, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I just want to be sure. I understand that this vehicle that we are considering um, obtaining is for the protection of the officers inside it. It's not for ramming in doors, correct? Sort of. <laughs> um, so this is uh, the replacement of our peacekeeper. It's something that we were already trying to acquire long before the requirement was put into place for the military equipment policy. And so it's virtually the same vehicle when I say sort of, is the front of the vehicle has the ability to attach devices to it. And there is a device that comes with this particular purchase or would come with this particular purchase that does have um, a RAM on it. The only, I understand your concerns, but I only want to express to you that it's not much different than the RAM that we already physically use by a member of the police department that would be using it at the front door of a residence. It would be a RAM that would be able to be put attached to the front of the vehicle so that they could safely breach the doorway of, of a home that might be um, a safety risk for an actual officer to go uh, up to the actual door to force open that doorway. So that's the type, type of a RAM that, it that would be attached to it and what it could be used for. Um, so I, I know that you're concerned about that, and so I just want to let you know that the times that you would use it, it would be in that situation where I'm sure you would understand you wouldn't want to send an officer up the door to open the doorway so that they could gain access. They want to do it more safely by using the protection of that vehicle that has the RAM attached to it. So. I, I think my concern is not so much using the RAM to get in because if you're out there dealing with horrible things and you have to, I get that. What my concern is is that the size of the RAM, so if you have to push open the door, whether it's by a human or by machine, then push open the door but I've seen them that they're so big, they push in the door and take out where you have to rebuild part of the building. That's the part I'm concerned about. So that wouldn't be an objective that we would uh, try to do, create damage like that? I mean, obviously the least amount of damage we, could, we would have to do it would be the, the most optimal solution. Um, it's making it, rendering the whole situation safe is, is obviously our objective. Of course. Um, I could tell you that our intent would be to use the RAM to open and provide access for officers to get into or other safety personnel to get into uh, that particular structure or their building at the time. 
but I don't want to tell you that an absolute guarantee that when you're trying to force open such as a door that it couldn't cause more damage than you would normally expect. It's not uncommon for individuals that um, are barricading themselves in structures um, that they wouldn't have fortified the door and sometimes those fortifications when we try to breach into that particular entrance it causes more damage because of the fortification versus if it was just a regular door such as your your own home which you don't typically fortify with Absolutely. steel beams and heavy boards and things like that those doors open relatively easily and so there isn't usually significant damage that is uh, um, that occurs when when the breaching occurs it's typically when things are barricaded of, of a such a strong nature that it makes it much more difficult for us to gain entry and that's where a lot of the damage occurs I, I know previously you talked about the claw and things like that where there was significant damage to a home um, that isn't something that we're um, purchasing to be attached to this particular type device. Is, is the ram the size of a door or smaller, or is it larger than the size of a door? So I'm not exactly certain on this particular piece of item, but it's typically not much bigger than maybe, usually the, the, the piece that actually makes contact with the door to open it is probably not bigger than about six inches in diameter. It could be 12, but I don't think it's that large. It's just large enough that you don't want to poke a hole through the door. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to press it and, and cause it the locking mechanism to fail so that you can actually open the door. So it can't be too small. Um, I can speak with absolute experience on that because in past when I had used a RAM back in my patrol days to gain access uh, in, into a residence, I've had the ram go through the door. And you don't want the ram to go through the door because then it defeats the purpose. You want it to actually breach the lock and open the door. So it does have to be a large enough size that it'll create that surface area that it won't poke through the door, um, but it's not gonna be overly large that it takes out the entire door in its entirety. It, it wouldn't be like that. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Anybody else on C7? Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, regarding the ram issue, um, I, I could see its use particularly if in the, well, let's, let's look at the high desert right now, what they're going through with respect to illegal grows and they're being in warehouses and they're actually some of them through their, I forgot what their task force is called. Um, anyhow, they do use vehicles and rams and sometimes the vehicles have to go through warehouse doors to gain access. Um, so I can see the value in that. I, I, I know that our department is very prudent in the use of existing rams and not damaging frames of, of, uh, of residential houses, because for the most part, we are not a city prone to that use, which is great. I wanted to make a comment in general, though. Thank you. I believe you also brought this up to us January 18th, of, uh, earlier in this year, through a Zoom presentation about the ordinance um, and the policy 707, which you presented to us, and you stated then that you were in contact prior to the implementation of this law and the policy in working with the county supervisor's office and gaining the funds to hopefully secure this item. And now that this is going to be secured, the funds purchased through that, through those means, thank you for pursuing that and I appreciate you following through uh, and I'm happy to see it on the agenda. I think it is a much needed uh, use of a protective wep weaponry for our police officers. Um, even though we're small and we don't have a history of problems in this town, which is great, we're not immune from them. Any political winds can change, which cause for some tensions. Um, even riots can exist even in the advent of a major earthquake and people in desperation gaining services. So um, I, I can see the benefit of this. So thank you for that, Chief. Thank you. And I think at this, if I'm correct, Supervisor Hagman's office uh, was using discretionary funds for this. We're advocating for this. For this that is uh, correct. Thank you. Yes. All right, C11. Who wants to start with C11? Go ahead. I have a question for staff. I, I'm just reading through the staff report. I understand, you know, I, I understand everything that we're doing, but what I don't understand is if we're going to be reimbursed for everything, why not just let them, why are we the middleman? That's the part I didn't understand. Because all of the entities that we use for all of the um, uh, analysis it, our contract agencies with the city of Montclair 
DIM can't contract with them? No, no. Under CEQA law, that's not permitted. They need to contract with the city. They work for the city, okay. not for the developers, so that we make certain that they uh, follow the requirements of CEQA as well as our own uh, development standards. So we simply arrange for a reimbursement from the developers in that case. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Starr. Anybody else on C-11? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, pages 218, 219 of the report, please. Um, bottom bullet point, the city would not exceed the estimated 156000 and some change of costs for the project without first informing the developer in writing regarding the need for additional services. Uh, and then in subsequent uh, sentences down, it says, however, if the developer objects to the excess cost, the developer must provide the city within a, with a written objection no later than five days after receipt of the city's written notice. Um, my question is, what if that notice, because we're closed on Fridays, it arrives to them on Monday, uh, they have no means to, or Tuesday, they have no means of, of reaching us given the three days in which we're closed, a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, would that eat into their time? Uh, well, no, it wouldn't because the, uh, the entities that we use to do the analysis under CEQA wouldn't be working on the weekends anyway, uh, typically, and we would know well in advance of them reaching their cap, and so we would already have been in contact with them, letting them know that they need to enter into an additional agreement to add additional funding for the purposes of reimbursement. And then if the... Um, if we're going to be required to maintain accurate records of invoices, we're, we're only giving them five days written, uh, for, written notice if they want to object to ex, uh, excess costs. We then, in the next bullet point, the city would be required to provide a payment summary to the developer within a reasonable time upon request. Why not it be uniform and us abide by the same five-day period that we just required of them in the prior bullet point? Uh, well, the city has uh, processes that we have to follow, including being responsive to the city council. So uh, we are not able to turn around and give them immediate responses back uh, simply because typically council meetings meet twice a month. If we have to go to the council to get direction from the city council, for example, on something, uh, then that would delay our ability to get back to them immediately. Uh, but in addition to that, we have to coordinate with all the different uh, uh, entities that are working under the CEQA process. Uh, we have to track what they're doing. Uh, we have to be responsive back to the developer, have regular meetings with the developer to go over what uh, the CEQA process is leading us to as it relates to the analysis. Um, and so all of these issues come into play on the city's part. Uh, the developer only sits there waiting for the city to produce its environmental study and then uh, are rendering our judgment as to what other directions we have to go. Uh, the developer's responsibility really is to just pay for those costs uh, related to us doing all of our due diligence. I, I just want it, I just want assurances that the city is not going to overburden this developer or any future developer with any unnecessary stipulations, requirements, fixes, or whatnot, and just kick this back and forth, um, knowing that, that we have $156,000 up to that point to expend. Um, I, I would hope that all the uh, contractors that we are using, DUDEC, BBNK, DTA, M and P, within their due diligence, minimize the billing mechanism by which uh, they would be sending to us for alleviating and addressing the particulars and the aesthetics and everything else for this project. That's my concern. Well, I, I can't speak to what the private develop or what the private companies do in relation to their analysis. There are certain standards. CEQA process is fairly familiar with all developers. They have an understanding of what uh, the CEQA analysis is going to cost them. So that in and of itself works as a, uh, as a leveler as to what they can expect to pay ultimately for the CEQA analysis. Uh, so sometimes something comes up. Uh, where it requires a greater analysis, uh, for example, in case of traffic conditions, uh, depending on what direction the developer wants to go in relation to the project that they're designing. Uh, we may have to have a broader outreach in relation to our traffic analysis, uh, so that could uh, suffer additional costs related to the developer. But the developer is kept informed at every stage of the process. They know what the costs are going to be. They know what additional costs may uh, be coming down the road. It's up to the developer whether or not they want to proceed with the CEQA analysis. If they don't, then of course they've just wasted a lot of money. 
and generally the amount of money that we get uh, that we give them in in the initial stage is pretty close to what the total cost will be but there are overcharges that occur okay thank you let's can i get a motion for approval so moved so moved Second, now include item C1, the city clerk, um, her language changed for the city manager to sign. And so let's have the electronic vote. Okay, that's adopted. All right, next item is um, item 10A, consider approval extension to the requirement uh, provided for resolution 22-3344 uh, regarding Councilmember Ben Lopez to attend the uh, sexual harassment pre prevention class. So I understand that uh, what's happened here is this is ex being extended from 30 days to 60 calendar days to allow Councilmember Lopez to attend a sexual harassment class. I believe it's on January the 1st in Los Angeles. And there's also a authorization request for $5,000 to be uh, transfer the contingency account to cover this cost, the way I understand a staff report. Um, I think we have a member of the audience that wishes to speak. Uh, is there... So who do we want to speak? Okay, Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. Okay. So Bruce, you request to speak on this item. Go ahead, Bruce. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> during this uh, public hearing, I heard uh, Ben Lopez say on several occasions that you know, when the state incurs a cost for the city, that he would like that uh, cost to be reimbursed. Um, I'm all for that. I think he's all for that. Uh, so, you know, I think this uh, item needs to be modified so that it requires that he reimburse uh, these costs that are being incurred by the city, by us taxpayers. So please, modify, you know, make a motion to modify this slightly and, and add that you know, his city council pay be uh, forfeited or put in an escrow until we can um, uh, determine how much he owes us uh, for his actions that caused this thing. Uh, you know, his sexual harassment. I've had several uh, entities that were uh, involved in this uh, sexual harassment contact me and ask. I was supposed to be at a dinner tonight with my my family from Scotland. I had to forgo that because I, I told my, my friends that I would stand up for him uh, constantly. This item is not going to go away. This issue is not going to go away. I promise these people I would make sure that they, their voices were heard, even when people are ridiculing them and putting them through all kinds of hell. So, um, Ben Lopez, you really have destroyed a lot of, you know, you've made a mess of this. And now you're costing the city and me more money. So I ask that you stand up, be a man, and, and, and volunteer just to reimburse reimburse the city for these costs that you, you know of, from your actions so uh if anybody there you know i know um you know he has not um you know he has not been uh, you know mostly he's just been rewarded for these actions you know by the city council you guys are you know you don't um you just let it go by without any action being taken that of, of any severe consequences he, he's just getting a float floating by here and now He's getting a luxury, uh, you know, uh, personalized sexual harassment prevention training class on my dime. So I ask that you guys ask them to reimburse these costs. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we'll bring the sign back to the council and the city attorney, if I'm correct, uh, the, the city council does not have the power to uh, uh, to uh, reduce a council member's salary or have the council member reimburse the city for, for costs incurred. Am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. So the only way that this can occur if council, uh, council member, in this case, Councilor Lopez, wishes to uh, to reimburse the city from their council salary. But that, again, that's the, the council member's prerogative. We don't have that power. So um, do I have a motion to uh, then to uh, take this action, staff report action, staff recommendation? Your motion? I, I will move. Moved by Councilman Martinez. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. And any more comments on this motion? And if not, uh, I will ask for a electronic vote. Okay, the uh, motion is adopted four to one. And uh, I would ask the city manager that uh, uh, if 
if, they, if the staff can update the city council if uh, this class has been completed or not. And also, I'm asking the city manager at a future meeting, can you bring back a report that indicates all the costs have been incurred so far regarding this, this particular uh, case? Thank you. Um, I apologize. I need to head over to Ontario Airport. I pick up my wife, so I'm going to go immediately to, into the mayor's communication, and I'm going to hand it over to the uh, to Mayor Pro Tem. But uh, first of all, um, just want to announce that we have openings on the Community Act Levies Commission, and th those openings will will close on May 18 at 5:30. Second of all, the City Council will have a a preliminary workshop for the budget on Wednesday, June 22nd at 6 p.m. And then we'll have a special meeting on June 28th for the adoption of the budget, and also at the same meeting or the same date, excuse me, separate meeting under a workshop uh, for the continuation of the San Antonio uh, Trail Project. Uh, two more items. I just want to state that uh, uh, I'd like to adjourn this meeting in the memory of Rancho Cucamonga Council Member Sam Spagnolo. Sam was uh, not only a member of the City Council of Rancho Cucamonga, but also he chaired the Army Trans Board of Directors, which I serve on. He was also president of the Inland Empire uh, Division, Lily California Cities. He was a retired uh, uh, firefighter with the Rancho Cucamonga Fire Protection Agency, and also he was the president of his, uh, of his firefighters association. So I will be attending his uh, funeral on Thursday, and I'll just say Sam is, uh, was a great guy, and I'm gonna definitely mi miss him. Lastly, uh, I did attend the uh, Southern California Association of Governments, their General Assembly and Conference that was held uh, two weeks ago in Conchella Valley, and so I was there as a delegate for the city of Montclair. So I'm going to end my comments, and I'm going to hand this meeting over to Mayor Pro Tem uh, Rue. If you want to sit here, uh, Bill, you're, you're welcome to do so. Again, I apologize to having to leave at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. What I'll do is start with Council Member uh, Martinez on any uh, comments she may have tonight. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rue. Um, you know, I would like to echo the comments made by Mr. Cole earlier today. Um, I appreciate the request by Mayor Dutre for an accounting of the expenditures that will be made by the city um, as a result of council members Lo Lopez's actions. And I do hope that there be some reimbursement in the future. Thank you. And before I can, before I continue, uh, we do have business item number 10 a uh, consider approval of extension of the requirement as, oh, we've already done that one. Um, I didn't check it off. Uh, department reports under communications before we get back to council communications, human services, upcoming events and programs. Great, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rue. Uh, we're excited to announce that on Saturday, May 28th at 12 noon, the splash pad will be reopened after being closed for two years. As the hot days are coming, we are happy this will be available for our community. Just a reminder that swimwear is required, no cotton denim or gym shorts allowed. Swim diapers are required for children three years of age or younger. The splash pad will be open every day through Labor Day or Monday, September 5th. Also, I want to mention that the hours of operation are subject to change due to unsafe weather conditions, maintenance and repair, or drought restrictions and regulations. On Monday, May 30th at 6 p.m., the Community Activities Commission will host their 22nd annual Memorial Day program. It will be held in the Memorial Garden and will include the dedication of six new plaques to the Veterans Memorial Wall. Please join us as we honor all branches of service on this holiday with patriotic songs, readings, and refreshments. The date again is Memorial Day, Monday, May 30th at 6 p.m. Our eighth annual Country Fair Jamboree will be taking place on Saturday, June 4th from noon to 6 p.m. at Alma Hoffman Park. This fun community event will have games, food, trucks, a petting zoo, carnival rides, craft vendors, contests, and live entertainment. Guests can save $5 per wristband with the early bird sale. Pre-sale wristbands will be sold at City Hall beginning next Monday, May 23rd to Thursday, June 2nd 
Monday through Thursday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Your $15 pre-sale wristband, which will be $20 the day of the event, are good for unlimited rides, games, pony rides, and the petting zoo. A $10 pre-sale wristband, $15 the day of the event, are good for unlimited ride and games. It does not include the petting zoo and pony rides. Event parking will be available at Our Lady of Lords Church and a shuttle service will be provided. The date again is Saturday, June 4th from noon to 6 p.m. and we're looking forward to seeing all of you attend. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, quick question. What day was the splash pad opening up? I'm sorry. 28th. Saturday, May 28th at 12 at noon. Noon. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that brings us to the city attorney request for the council to meet in closed session pursuant to government code uh, regarding potential litigation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. That's correct. It's, it's regarding um, the question of initiating litigation. So one case pursuant to that code section. That's all I have this evening. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. City Manager, uh, Executive Director. No items. No items. Okay, that brings us back to uh, where Mayor Dutre left off. We do have an appointment of vacancies for the Community Activities Commission. There are four. You can apply at www.cityofmontclair.org, and that has to be done by Wednesday, May 18th by 5.30 p.m. We also have considered scheduling a meeting for the fiscal year 2022 to 2023 preliminary budget review, presentation of budget adoption, and tentatively proposed for Wednesday, June 22nd, 2022 at 6 p.m. and Tuesday, June 28th, 2022 at 6 p.m. in the city council chambers. Uh, I can say most assuredly that on the 22nd, I will have to do that virtually. I have a work conference part of that week. As for the 28th, uh, I need to verify my calendar. It will either be in person or via Zoom or something of that sort. That brings us back to the council members. Council member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I'm gonna have a couple of um, items that I wanted to report, but first I just have to say I am delighted beyond measure that the splash pad is gonna be open. That is a wonderful thing to really support the people of our community who are living in dense conditions with no air conditioning and they need to find some relief for their children. So kudos for the whole team who worked hard to make that happen. I appreciate that and, and the residents appreciate that probably more than you know. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm, I did a little happy dance when you said that. The other thing I wanted to talk about is that um, I had the privilege of going to the Ontario Montclair School District Parents Conference uh, as well, along with City Manager Starr, Director Rich Richter and uh, Councilwoman Martinez. Uh, it really gave us a great opportunity to talk to the parents to see what was important to them and their children, but the other side of that is that several of the parents said, you know, it's so good to see some people here representing Montclair because most of the people who were there were talking about Ontario, Ontario, <laughs> and they said, no, we, we're, one lady said, I live in Montclair, and I'm glad that you, you guys are here representing Montclair. So that was a wonderful event, and I believe it's an annual event. Of course, stupid COVID slowed it down, but um, hopefully it'll come again next year, and I would certainly encourage everyone to attend. And the la my last comment is that um, during this upcoming holiday weekend, we've got an extra day to clean out some clutter. We'll bring it all over to the Montclair Chamber of Commerce on May 28th and 29th. We are having another e-waste event. It's an all-day event from 9 to 2, touchless. You just put that stuff you don't want in the back of your car, drive up. Somebody will take it out of your car, and you'll be done. You'll be on your way in minutes. That's all I have tonight. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Tony, since you're excited about the splash pad, uh, I dare you one weekend. Let's both you and I run through it. No? We are you not. You don't want to do that? <laughs> no. You don't, wanna, you don't want to christen well, it? <laughs> well, no. Our luck, you're, either you or I, one of us will step on something and break Slip. it. I'm not getting in it. No, sir. No, sir, I'm not. <laughs> I just had to bring it up. Nice try, I guess. Yeah. Um, on the 14th, uh, I was encouraged by some Ontario Montclair School District folks to attend the Chafee Theater Company's performance, one of their last few performances of the Adams Family at Gardner Spring Auditorium. Um, it was predominantly Chafee High School students. 
Um, the cast was at least 50, 60 strong. Um, nearly, more than half of them had 4.0 or greater GPAs. A lot of them were seniors. Uh, these kids were exceptional. Uh, they should actually be in professional, well, that was actually a professional quality performance that they put on. Um, but it was, it was great to be there, great to, to see those kids be, be active and, uh, uh, and provide some comedy entertainment on stage for a very reasonable, reasonable price. Tickets should have been more. Um, lastly, I will make some comments. The, Mayor Dutre asked that we adjourn in memory of, of Councilman Rancho Cucamonga Councilman Sam Spagnolo. I met him and knew him since the late 1980s when I was working for Judge Linda Wilde. And um, he was a fireman at the time and not on council. And um, Sam, since that time, was a confidant of mine, someone I could turn to, a mentor on fire issues, and repeatedly uh, offered me support and uh, uh, advice, direction um, on fire issues in the region. And he always appreciated the fact that I hadn't dropped the ball on fire issues. And so um, I was very shocked and saddened to hear of Sam's passing. Um, he was a, an asset to the community, a very gentle, gentleman uh, to the T, um, not a man of many words, but when he did speak, it was, it was precise, it was poignant, it was meaningful. He was the quiet one on the dais in Rancho Cucamonga, but like I said, whenever he did offer uh, some words, it was, it was coming from a wise, wise owl, if you, if you will. Um, I would like to request like we did for Chino, former Chino Councilman Mark Hargrove, that we provide a certificate um, reflecting the fact that we did adjourn this meeting in, in his memory for Councilman Spag Spagnolo. To my friends and colleagues on that council, my friends um, Christine Scott and Ryan Hutchison, my condolences to, to you and your city, to the people of Ranch Cucamonga. We care about, we care about you, we, we empathize. We've been here before as well as a city and we um, offer our condolences and our prayers to his family and to the great people of Rancho Cucamonga. Thank you. Yes, and, and I will leave off where Councilmember Lopez began. I had known Sam Spagnolo from his days as a firefighter and knew that he was very much a professional. Much of what Councilmember Lopez said, I could have said as well. He loved his community, he loved his city, it was just the end of the world for him. That's what he cared about. And that is to be praised. He did a great job in helping to guide the city even before he was on the council in many, many different areas. So I know he will be missed. And the entire council right now is in a difficult place with this. And we send our condolences. I wanted, we already heard about Memorial Day and the uh, country fair, so I can take that off my list. One of the things I wanted to mention, we had the presentation about the waste, and what we're going to do with it. I would suggest, and this is not just for the legislature, this is something where the waste haulers and providers need to be involved directly Stop what they've been doing for the last 20 years, which is pushing back. In most of the Western world, or in many parts of the Western world, and I say that because I should say the developed world, they have something called waste to energy plants. There's none of this sorting things out. There's none of what we go through here. It's taken to a waste to energy plant. It is processed and made into energy, energy that can be used to power buildings, air conditioning, you name it. The byproduct are small pellets. They're used in roadbed material, in parking berms, and so many different things. And yet, at least for the last 20 years that I've been following this, every single waste hauler in the state of California has pushed back on that. It's the simple solution. All of them need to band together, use the economies of scale, and start building them. That's going to be a solution. It's much better than what we're going through here. We can then take our landfills, use them, pump out the energy, the methane in there, and use that. So when I hear the waste haulers say how much they don't like something, it's time they started pushing something that can actually get done in California. 
I'm, if you think I'm frustrated, I am. Because I'm tired of listening to excuses by waste haulers. That's what they are. What we need to do is build the waste to energy plants. In fact, they're in Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, Canada, and Canada in general has a far more strict environmental rule than we do. They work. The other thing I'd like to mention is earlier, or uh, on Thursday of last week, Mayor Dutre, representing San Bernardino County Transportation Agency, and I, representing the city of Montclair, were at the Gold Line JPA meeting, which was held online this time until they decide to do otherwise. One of the things we did was to review the different stations, the artwork that will be there, and the positioning of the trains as they, or the cars as they come in. I think as you go through the, once they're built and you go through the region, you're going to see a very, very good variety of station design, each one reflecting that community, some more elaborate than others. But all of them were beautifully done. I think that once we have the gold line, you will enjoy all of that. I will also note that even now as we recover from a pandemic and people are saying they don't want to take mass transit, the gold line is still the, uh, I should say the L line because that's what it's going to be in the future. The gold line is still the busiest line in the system. It carries more riders than any of the other ones. So that tells you that it is a success and will be a success as it moves out here to Montclair. And I, I truly want to thank all of our partners in this Claremont, Pomona, Laverne, San Dimas, Glendora, Azusa, I can go on and on for their tremendous support of the gold line. And I think that's it. We will adjourn tonight in the memory of council member Sam Spagnolo. And I know Mayor Dutre will do a good job in making sure the certificates uh, get over to him. With to close session.